Could I welcome um, everybody to the third discussion meeting of the 2020 session of the Royal Statistical Society. Um, this, as you are fully aware, is being held as an interactive online meeting um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I am the chair, uh, Guy Nason. Um, and we have the uh, Honorary Secretary, Christophe Andrew, also on the line. Uh, and obviously we have a, a wonderful um, discussion uh, meeting paper to be uh, read and discussed uh, in a few minutes time. Um, I've got a few jobs to do before uh, we start the meeting. Um, my first uh, duty was to welcome everybody, so fellows and visitors to this third discussion meeting. Um, I'd like to just do a little bit of explanation. So this is an online format, obviously, and it's designed to follow as closely as possible the traditional red paper meeting. Um, we're all connecting from home or, or elsewhere. And of course, we might experience intermittent connection problems on the Internet uh, and possible occasional unplanned domestic issues. Uh, usually in my case is the dog goes completely mad, but I'm sure you'll have your own your own issues. Um, if that happens, please do not worry. Um, we'll all um, get over that. Um, and we understand that these things happen with online meetings. Um, if you've got technical problems, uh, this is notably uh, the speakers and uh, discussants, um, please use the meeting chat box to outline your query, or you can email reception at rss.org.uk, who will sort it out with you. And in particular, the chat. Uh, is very helpful to communicate um, with us. Um, the meeting is being recorded and hopefully you'll see a notice at the top of your screen on this. And the meeting will be posted on YouTube afterwards with the slides of the meeting. Um, if you're not comfortable with that um, or you want your contribution to be made audio only uh, after the event or edited out, again, please contact contact reception at rss.org.uk and we will um, arrange that for you. Um, only presenters today will be using video. So please, if you're not speaking or discussing, please turn your video off. That will help the bandwidth of the meeting. And also, unless you are speaking, please do keep your microphone muted. I think we can control that to a certain degree from this end, but it will really help, especially since we um, have a large number of people on the meeting. If you're not speaking, please keep your microphone muted. Um, speakers, of course, please use your uh, laptop and PC with a headset if possible um, to give us a good quality um, audio signal. For these meetings, everyone is actively encouraged to contribute to the discussion of the paper. Co comments can be made uh, in an open session, but that open session is held at the end of the meeting. Um, please do not attempt to ask questions uh, in the meeting whilst the presentation is going on. Um, and the reason is that's the traditional RSS discussion meeting format. And in fact, it's a little bit easier in the online format because uh, we can basically stop you speaking um, or, or videoing. But in, in, the, in the physical session in the RSS, um, people aren't allowed to ask questions. Um, however, they are al allowed to make a discussion contribution um, after um, uh, the main presentation and the proposer and the seconder. If you want to contribute to the discussion and you haven't already let us know in advance, please enter your name and affiliation into the meeting chat facility and you can do this at any time during the open session. We have several RSS staff who are monitoring the chat and we'll take that information from you. Um, when the open session comes along later on, I will invite you to unmute your audio and you'll have five minutes to make your comment. So that's um, it for the rules. Um, I'd like now to welcome uh, uh, very much so and introduce uh, today's uh, paper for reading. And the title of the paper is Quasi-Stationary Monte Carlo Methods and the Scale Algorithm. And the authors are Murray Pollock, Paul Fernhead, Adam Johansson and Gareth Roberts. And the presentation today is being given by uh, Murray and Gareth. And I'm gonna hand over to uh, Murray who's speaking first um, to continue with the presentation. Thanks very much, Guy. Hopefully everybody can hear me. <coughs> um, if you could go to the next slide, please. I, I should remark, Gareth and I are sharing the same slide deck, and so there'll be occasional interjections of next slide. Um, OK, to, to motivate the, the paper, or the original motivation for the work within the paper, 
what what we were interested in was essentially the, the scalability of statistical algorithms in the context of big data, which is a buzzword and it's a controversial buzzword. But to sort of convey the notion of, of what we're interested in, what we'll think about is essentially this simplified target of interest. So pi here is my target distribution. And each one of my FI, you can think about as being the contribution of an individual data point to the likelihood. Now, the key thing here is n is very large in this simplified setting, so it's much bigger than one. And this is essentially a problem within a lot of statistical algorithms because you need to do pointwise evaluations of either pi or quantities related to pi. And that's typically going to be an order n evaluation. So throw enough data at it, you're going to break your algorithm. So a slightly facetious way around this problem is either not to do or, or minimize the number of these order n computations. And really the focus of our work has been to develop Monte Carlo approaches which are exact, not approximate. And by exact, we mean in the Monte Carlo sense up to Monte Carlo error. So the first couple of slides, we're going to give a bit of an overview of, of what's happening in the area uh, and contextualise what we are doing. So when it comes to looking at big data, there, there are sort of two indicative approaches. The first I'm going to call multi or many core algorithms uh, and the second one single core. Next slide, please. So multi-core approaches, which is not central to what we're doing, so I won't spend too long on, is essentially an idea where you think about your data and try to exploit modern computing architectures, GPUs, or, or the fact you've got lots of cores, to divide up your task and make it more efficient. And the general paradigm is you take your data, you split it into lots of separate data sets, separately conduct inference on the separate data sets and try to recombine the separately conducted inference into a coherent inference. So there is lots of work on this. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the problem really is when it comes to recombination. How do you do this procedure? And this is quite tricky without introducing either strong assumptions or quite strong approximations to, to the algorithms. Next slide. The other paradigm is what I'm calling single core and QSMC and scale, which we'll come on to later as an example of a single core approach, by which I mean we only use a single computer or a single core like we would ordinarily do in such algorithms. So the key idea with a lot of these approaches is to try and reformulate existing algorithms in such a way as to avoid the order n evaluations. So to sort of illustrate this, I'm going to discuss this in conjunction with the illustrative example, which is slightly below. So if you think about, for instance, Metropolis Hastings, which is perhaps the, the gold standard algorithm out there, the one that's most prolifically used within the Monte Carlo literature, what are we doing? Well, we're making a move around our state space from one point to another, according to some proposal density which is then accepted or rejected with some acceptance probability. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the, the direct bottleneck is really computing this acceptance probability. So what, what you'll notice is within the acceptance probability, I have an order n evaluation of pi. So what are the sorts of things you could do? Well, you could try and make more informed proposals, better proposals to make the algorithm itself more efficient and minimize the number of times you need to do this evaluation. And this leads on to a whole bunch of aspects in literature related to um, stochastic gradient methods, for instance. So although you want to have informed proposals, you don't want to look at all of your data in order to do the informed proposals. Other things people have tried in the literature include simply just removing the acceptance probability or not doing it which introduces a different type of approximation, which is not the direct work we're going to look at in this paper. 
And perhaps the closest analogue to what we do is the, the notion that perhaps if I was to find an efficient, by efficient I mean an order one in data size, unbiased estimator for the acceptance probability itself, if I was able to construct such a thing, then I could use that instead in the algorithm and without losing any of the statistical properties of the algorithm, I could dramatically increase the efficiency. So that's the sort of flavour of different things that have appeared in the literature. But the closest thing really is the unbiased estimation, which is different in nature the way we apply it. Next slide, please. So really, this is an overview of what Gareth and I are going to be discussing today. Um, I've ho hopefully given you some idea of the intuition uh, or the motivation for the, the approaches that we're taking. I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some background and rationale for the reason we're doing particular things in a particular way, which perhaps looks um, difficult on first glance, but has a, a, a rationale. But then we're going to be talking about quasi-stationarity, or rather Gareth's going to be talking about quasi-stationarity, how to construct the Monte Carlo algorithm to sample from quasi-stationary distributions, which we'll introduce, and then how you might adapt such algorithms in the case of big data. OK, next slide, please. So some background and rationale, and basically here I'm taking the highlights of my part of the demo and trying to motivate um, what we're doing in, in the order that we're doing. I, I should mention that I believe the demo is being recorded, so if there's not quite enough detail on these slides, then it's perhaps worth referencing back to the recording later. Next slide. So, so one thing which throws people slightly looking at this paper is really thinking about why we're interested in working in continuous time. It seems like an unnecessary complication and why specifically we're interested in diffusions. So just to briefly introduce what we're doing, what we've got at the top of the slide there is what's known as the Langevin diffusion, which you can think about as having two pieces, a drift component and a volatility component, noise driven by Brownian motion. And the deterministic component of this diffusion uses information about the target distribution pi. Now, why are we interested in this particular diffusion? That's the, the key first question. Well, basically, you can draw an analog with MCMC. If you think about MCMC, what we're doing is we're choosing dynamics of a Markov chain to target a specific distribution and then using the output of that algorithm as a proxy for the distribution pi we're interested in. Similarly, we could try and simulate from this Langevin diffusion, which has an invariant distribution pi, and using the trajectory, we could use it as a Monte Carlo scheme for pi. Now, the crux of what was in the demo is it's not actually directly possible to use rejection sampling schemes to get exact draws from this um, diffusion measure. And although it's possible to get an approximation, it's not directly useful when you're doing Monte Carlo for diffusions. But some interesting things, and the reason we're looking in continuous time, is it is possible to simulate Langevin diffusion bridges using rejection sampling, and this can be done exactly. And one of the key remarks is really the acceptance probability in this rejection sampler is linear in terms of grad log pi and Laplacian of log pi. And this linearity is really what gives us some hope that it might be useful for big data. Why might it be useful for big data? Well, in continuous time, what we're really trying to do when we construct unbiased estimators is get an unbiased estimator of something which is linear in N, as opposed to something in discrete time like MCMC, which looks like a product. And the nice thing is, when you're in continuous time, constructing such unbiased estimators is very straightforward. You can, for instance, just uniformly at random choose one of the data points and you can construct an unbiased estimator. So obviously we'll talk about this in a bit more detail later, but it gives you the idea of why it might be useful. <clears throat> 
Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about quasi-stationarity, and for this, I'm going to hand over to Gareth. OK, thanks uh, very much, Murray. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? OK, so quasi-stationarity um, is fundamental to the ideas behind this paper. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction here. Um, some of this will overlap with what Paul was presenting in the demo, but it is particularly important. So uh, uh, I'm going to go over it again. Um, so it has a long history, dates back to uh, a Russian mathematician, Akiva Yaglom, uh, in 1947. Um, and it has, a, it's a sort of theory which um, in some sense mimics the theory of ergodicity of Markov chains or Markov processes uh, with a twist. And the twi that twist makes things somewhat more complicated. So whereas for a Markov process, we might be in a situation of having Markov process X, T for T bigger than zero, and uh, the, the theory of ergodicity of Markov chains is of course really well understood and uh, perhaps the most understood problem in probability in many ways um, and that's uh, reaped uh, uh, huge dividends in the sense that the applications are massive in all sorts of areas uh, not least at MCMC which has already been mentioned by uh, Murray. Quasi-stationarity uh, also starts with the Markov process. Um, it turns out that um, uh, we, we will not normally be doing this in discrete time, we'll do it in continuous time as Murray said. Um, but we also have a stopping time tor associated with this Markov process. Now this stopping time or a killing time is just a time at which the Markov process just basically stops or jumps to some kind of coffin state. What the quasi-limiting distribution is, is the limiting distribution of the distribution of xt uh, conditional on not having been killed by time t. Um, so this is a quasi-limiting distribution and analogously to the ergodicity of Markov chains, this is closely related to the idea of quasi-stationary distribution, uh, which is on the bottom displayed equation there, which is just the idea that if we start off from some distribution nu at time zero and we actually run the Markov chain till time t um, and only count the paths for which uh, killing hasn't happened so far, then it turns out that I will still have a distribution nu, except that everything is discounted by this factor e to the minus lambda t. Well, lambda here um, uh, b behaves a little bit like a kind of average killing rate for the Markov, for the for the Markov process. Now, whereas in Markov chain theory. Um, uh, the relationship between quasi, uh, between stationarity and limiting distributions is something that's extremely well understood and something we teach our undergraduates. It's a much more subtle question in, for quasi-stationarity. Next slide, please. Um, so the theory is, is less well developed uh, than for Markov chains. Um, and the existence of quasi-limiting distributions and quasi-stationary distributions is, is somewhat more, more subtle and in fact, uh, quasi-station distributions are not necessarily unique in the kind of ways that you might expect. The most studied case is the hard killing case, which is where we essentially kill the Markov process when it leaves some region C. Um, but we're going to be interested in the soft killing case, which is the situation where X is killed according to some kind of hazard rate, uh, kappa, uh, which is dependent on the current location of the Markov chain uh, 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 XT. So this is what we'll consider. Next slide, please. So a simple illustrative uh, example. Um, suppose this is a contour map of some region in Africa, and this is a contour map of, of the uh, of, of lions. Um, and suppose, uh, next slide, please. And so Next slide. And suppose we actually run um, um, a stochastic process given by the red trajectory there. Um, uh, of an antelope. Now, antelopes don't like to meet lions because they might get killed. Um, this particular lion has been lucky because it's traveled through an area of quite high lion density and has survived till time t, as denoted by the red triangle. But uh, next slide, please. If we run multiple copies of this stochastic process, um, then we have, for instance, five copies there denoted by the different colors. Three of those antelope have, have survived uh, as denoted by the red triangles, but two black circles correspond to ones which have actually been killed before this particular time T. Uh, 
So quasi-limiting distributions are all about the limiting distribution of the location of those red triangles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, th that's the concept that we want to, to get across, and we're, we're interested in, in, um, in, in accessing quasi-station distributions. Um, but we will need to have uh, efficient simulation algorithms that allow us to access uh, these distributions. Naive, naive simulation would involve running uh, chains of this kind, uh, many chains for uh, long periods of time, but are going to be uh, very inefficient because obviously the longer that you run this, the more uh, chance there is of the uh, antelopes being uh, killed and therefore uh, the computational cost used on, on, on co uh, computing that, that particular trajectory being wasted. And this is in contrast to the simple situation for, say, Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, where if we start off with K trajectories, then we have always got K trajectories so that the efficiency of the algorithm is not, in some sense, diminishing as time proceeds. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're not careful, you'll end up with a situation like this, where almost all of your trajectories involve wasted um, computational effort, and there's only three out of about 100 trajectories here uh, which are of any use. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we want to find some way of going from what would be an MCMC algorithm to a, a quasi-stationary Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, and so, of course, in Markov chain Monte Carlo, what we do is we start off with a target distribution pi, and then the Metropolis-Hastings mechanism, which you all know well, says that we have some proposal mechanism Q, and given that proposal mechanism, um, we tweak it using an acceptance rate uh, to achieve the correct um, um, stationary distribution pi. Okay, we want to do something analogous to this. So what we want to do is find quasi-stationary distribution. We start off with pi, our target distribution, and we choose some dynamics, which could be arbitrary in some sense. But then what we want to do is we want to tweak those dynamics using a killing rate, kappa, in order to satisfy the quasi-stationary quasi relation uh, at the bottom of the page. So that's what we'd like to do. Um, next page, uh, next slide, please. Um, and what we've managed to do in this paper, in the case of Brownian motion, in fact, you can do this more generally, but we've concentrated almost exclusively on Brownian motion here. For Brownian motion, um, we've worked out what the killing rate would ha actually have to uh, look like in order to achieve uh, uh, the quasi-stationary distribution pi. And theorem one in our paper says that under weak regularity conditions, if you choose this um, hazard rate at the top of the page, which is given in terms of derivatives and second derivatives of the log density, then you have quasi-stationary and quasi-limiting distributions pi. I'm now going to pass back to Murray, who's going to continue the uh, presentation. Thanks, Gareth. So as Gareth was just mentioning, we now have the, the foundations of an approach in which we can exploit results about quasi-stationarity for developing a Monte Carlo algorithm. And really it's dependent on or dependent on this result that we've got where we, we choose an appropriate kappa. However, as Gareth was alluding to, unlike MCMC, actually developing practical methodology is not quite as straightforward. So there are a few issues. So within the methodology, we simulate Brownian motion killed at a particular rate. Of course, how might you do that? So the kill rate's not going to be homogeneous, so it's not straightforward, it's going to be inhomogeneous. As, as Gareth was discussing with his antelope, there's a real issue about simulating it for a sufficiently large time or increasing time. And of course, we've not really discussed in any detail at all how, how this might actually be useful when it comes to big data scenarios. Next slide, please. So within the second half of the demo earlier, we spent a lot of time talking about rejection sampling for diffusions. So it transpires simulating Brownian motion, which is killed at a particular rate kappa, is analogous to this type of simulation I discussed in the second part of the demo, 
And, but instead of using the intensity phi, you would use the intensity kappa. Otherwise, the actual methodology is very straightforward, and I'd, I'd refer you to that. The key thing is, essentially, we can simulate such objects. We can simulate Brownian motion at a particular killing rate. And what we do in practice is, rather than killing at a particular rate, we instead think about simulating a Brownian motion trajectory, which we import and weight. Next slide. So this is perhaps easiest to see pictorially. So a slight complication which was discussed in the, the demo is you can't simulate Brownian motion in, in the sense that we're perhaps used to in our undergraduate. You simulate Brownian motion together with information which constrains the Brownian motion. So in this picture here, we know our Brownian motion sample path is contained within particular intervals. Right? And that's a, a technical detail. It's possible to simulate that. So we've got a realization of Brownian motion. And what we'll do is at various times given by a dominating intensity, capital K. Next slide, please. We'll have potential changes in the importance weight. So what you'll see is given by the dotted lines, as that particular Brownian motion trajectory evolves, its importance weight will evolve as well. And periodically given by potential event times, the importance weight will, will jump downwards. So there'll be a, a decrease in the importance weight. And that's related to the probability of killing, or one minus the, the killing rate. Next slide, please. So once we've got this Brownian motion, which is importance, weight, importance weighted to approximate the, the killed Brownian motion, we need to address how to simulate this process for large time t. So as Paul indicated in his half of the demo, one approach we can try and employ is to propagate a continuous time set of weighted particles or weighted trajectories. So there'd be lots of Brownian motions evolving together in time and in weight, and we'll use results from sequential Monte Carlo, as Paul discussed slightly earlier, the details are, are, are at the end of the, the paper in one of the appendices. Next slide, please. So simulating from the quasi-stationary distribution, what we do in practice is have, in this paper, we have a collection of particles which are evolving in time. And like the standard SMC type constructions, at various points in time, say time five, say time 12, we resample this particle set and continue evolving it. And this gets around the problem that Gareth was discussing with antelope all getting eaten for some large time t. What this ensures is we've got um, particles still there in order to uh, approximate our distributions of interest. Next slide, please. So the third aspect, the sub third practical problem we're going to discuss is obviously now that we've got a Monte Carlo algorithm for exploiting this result on quasi-stationarity, how might we then exploit it for big data? Next slide. So just to recap what we have, but, but give it a, a slightly different angle and think about the complexity of what I've just introduced, this quasi-stationary Monte Carlo algorithm. What we're in practice doing is we're simulating killed Brownian motion. And this killed Brownian motion that we're simulating, we use a, a proposal rate for the killing. It's going to be killed at a potential rate k, which is bigger than the true rate kappa. And each one of these proposed killing times, we then decide whether to accept or reject it. Accept it as a killing event or, or reject it, not a killing event. And that's with probability kappa over k. So this is analogous to a Poisson thinning-like argument. Now, if you think about the complexity of this algorithm, if you were to fix time, the interval of time you want to simulate the algorithm over, then the bounding intensity, k, the cost associated with that is order one. Simulating the, the dominating Poisson process is of order one. However, determining the acceptance rejection, i.e. evaluating cap over k, well, cap is a function of all of the data, and so that's an order n operation. So the whole algorithm, the quasi-stationary Monte Carlo, 
in of, of itself is an order n algorithm. And the key remark here is what we really want to do is try and find as tight a possible bound on kappa. So if I was, for instance, to choose a bound on kappa which wasn't tight enough, say k tilde, then I increase the inefficiency of the algorithm or I increase the computational requirements of the algorithm by a factor which looks like k tilde over k. But otherwise, the algorithm is identical. The temporal convergence of the algorithm is identical. Next slide, please. So, going on to subsampling. Well, the key idea is what we want to do is construct an order one unbiased estimator of this quantity kappa over k tilde, which is our current order n evaluation, while ensuring the inefficiency induced by modifying the algorithm remains order one. So this inefficiency factor k tilde over k remains order one. So how might you go about this? Well, a slight simplification is to think about this intensity by which you're killing the Brownian motion sample path being linear in the data, right? So each data point contributes its own quantity related to the killing rate. Now, a key observation we have in the paper is these terms, these contributory terms to the killing rate kappa i, are very well behaved near modal points of the distribution. And so what we do is we construct a control variate round about those modal points. So we compute kappa x hat, where x hat is some well-chosen point. So within the algorithm, this would require some order n initialization, which you could, for instance, parallelize and such like. So because we have this linearity in the intensity rate, and because we can find an, a nice control variate, then on the next part down, what you'll see is we can very easily construct an unbiased estimator. So if I define kappa tilde, as on the slide, then I can find an unbiased estimator of kappa by simply just choosing one of the, the data points uniformly at random. So some remarks on this. We do require some form of initialization, but typically this will either be equivalent or easier than finding a posterior approximation. Although computing the killing rate is now order one, the true cost of the algorithm is going to be driven by the scaling of this k tilde over k and how that scales with data size. But the actual underlying algorithm is statistically identical to the original QSMC algorithm. It's just computationally changed. It's become more efficient. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Gareth. Um, thanks, Murray. Uh, next slide, please. So in this part of a talk, uh, we will briefly discuss the theoretical results um, that are in the paper related to computational complexity. Uh, as, as Murray's just told you, the uh, control variant idea substantially decreases the hazard rate upper bound um, k, k tilde, and it gets better when x is closer to uh, x hat. Uh, moreover, the computational effort is also proportional to k tilde, uh, so therefore, for large n, it comes as no surprise that the complexity of a scale algorithm is really very closely connected to the idea of a posterior concentration. Now we're going to look at um, the um, complexity of the algorithm by splitting up the computational effort into two components. First of all is the initialization component. What does that involve? That, inf that involves finding this, this good x hat, which is typically going to be close to the mode, and maybe also some further information to find the, um, some notions of the, the multivariate spread of a distribution in order to calibrate the algorithm. And then the other part of the algorithm is the, what we call the iterative complexity of scale, uh, which is basically the computational cost associated with actually running the algorithm once we've got it set up in the first place. Okay, so what we, so for this result, this is theorem three in the paper, 
Um, we're going to use um, the notion of posterior contraction as we've just motivated. So uh, what we want here is, uh, very loosely speaking, we want a typical value x um, to be within order n to the minus eta over 2 of x tilde. So this posterior contraction, the, the normal rate, the usual rate for, for nice smooth densities, as we know, is n to the minus a half. So that would correspond to the case of eta equals 1. But the second condition we actually want is related to initialization. And it really depends on, the complexity depends on how good a job we did on this initialization phase. So right in the middle of the, the theorem, you'll see um, uh, a displayed equation involving uh, a measure of how well we did on that um, initial uh, part of the uh, setup. Uh, essentially, if we really did find exactly the mode, then the gradient of log log pi x hat would be zero. But as long as we actually only allow this, the, the modulus of this quantity to grow like n to the iota, then we get a, a bound on the complexity, the iterative complexity of scale given by the expression below, where var, var phi is equal to that expression. Now that's not very easy to interpret, but intuitively the idea is, is as long as we do enough work on the initialization, uh, then the um, uh, then the um, the cost uh, emanating from uh, the initialization will not be a limiting factor. Uh, so next slide, please. So the aim would normally be to do enough work on the maximization um, or, or, sorry, uh, locating the x x hat initially um, to ensure that iota was less than or equal to one minus eta over two. And that gives a much simpler ex expression for the complexity. And specializing even further, if we set um, eta to be one, which is the regular case, and if we just specify that the modulus of the gradient of log pi x tilde uh, has to be at least within order n to the half, uh, of zero, uh, then actually we get iterative complexity of scale to be uh, order one. Now I stress that this, this is actually results which uh, are proved under rather idealistic conditions and um, we could certainly weaken these conditions if we had to, um, but that would likely lead to something that which wasn't quite as pure as the order one convergence. For in, we haven't put any of this in the paper, but for instance, if you have certain covariates that grow at certain rates, then you tend to get logarithmic terms adding into, in, into the complexity. Uh, but this is a, a nice clean statement that we can get that at least in principle suggests that scale um, should scale extremely well with large data sets. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is table one in the paper, which now just uh, combines the iteration, the iterative comp complexity, and also the initialization complexity, um, and combi combines it with uh, with uh, uh, certain other algorithms. I think the uh, the main thing to note is is um, the following remarks that if the um, if uh, var phi is actually less than one then uh, the iteration complexity is, um, uh, is, is has a smaller order of magnitude than the initialization. Um, and in particular, in the case where we have um, var phi equals zero, then if we start off, for instance, with something like a, a good Gaussian approximation to our posterior distribution, such as a Laplace approximation, then there is proportionately a negligible uh, uh, subsequent cost in applying scale to actually improve that to get, uh, in principle, an exact algorithm. Okay, I'm now going to pass back to Murray again, and uh, um, to uh, so next slide, please. Thanks, Gareth. So, I just wanted to discuss a, a few different examples. There, there's quite a few in the section seven of the paper. Um, but we'll discuss some that I think are perhaps the most interesting. Next slide, please. So we're looking at QSMC and scale. So example one in the paper, what we've got, and I, I won't go into too much details about the actual data set or, or the particular model, but what we've got here is a target distribution which has some skew in it. So if you look at the upper plots on this diagram, or figure, these are essentially 
for the two um, covariates of interest, uh, these are trace plots that you might get out of QSMC or scale. So what, what are we seeing here? What we're seeing on the x-axis is time, the evolution of the sequential Monte Carlo scheme. And for any particular instance of time, we have a collection of uh, particles representing the distribution at that time. On the bottom plot, basically, we've got the same covariate, covariates of interest. Um, essentially, we've got the marginal densities. So the different colours here, and this remains constant throughout all of the examples, the different colours here, we have black to represent the output of, in this case, QSMC. Red is a normal approximation you might get for this example, and green is the output you may achieve from MCMC. So this is the sort of indicative output you might get. This is a small data set. I think the data set is of size 10 here, but it gives you a flavour of what you might get out and what you might be wanting to look at. Uh, next slide, please. So example three within the paper, we look at a particular data set, which we call the airline data set, which is of size 123 million. So at that stage, it's becoming slightly more complicated to directly use off the shelf R packages and such like, which is getting towards big data, I guess. And what you'll see is the same sort of um, output as before. You know, on the top, we've got our trace plot. On the bottom, we're looking at marginal densities. This time, we're, we're in four dimensions. And what you'll see is it's a particular example where actually the approximation scheme that we employ here doesn't work very well for the, for the fourth dimension, whereas um, scale in this situation uh, and the MCMC are, are giving reasonably good output. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the final one we're looking at, this is a synthetic data set. But basically, in this example, we're in five dimensions and we're looking at data sets of size 2 to the power 20 up to 2 to the power 34. And this example, everything appears to be very Gaussian. But I guess what the, the key thing is, is on the next slide, if you want to go to the next slide, is if we actually compute the computational cost as a function of the data size, so this is on a log-log scale, you can see it's, it is actually order one in this situation. So that's example four within the paper. Next slide, please. So just to wrap things up, um, I want to discuss perhaps you know, what the contributions of this paper are and where we see it going, if anybody wants to take on the baton. Uh, next slide. So essentially, the key contributions of the paper are, we, we first of all developed some theory in order to think about quasi-stationarity in the setting where we want to specify the quasi-stationary distribution and choose the dynamics such that we target that quasi-stationary distribution pi. The notion being that we want to ultimately develop this as a Monte Carlo scheme. And really QSMC is the development of methodology to do this exact sampling from the quasi-station distribution pi. And what we're calling scale, sort of second half of this talk, is essentially using principled subsampling to achieve up to an order one iterative complexity with data size. From a statistical point of view, QSMC and scale are identical, really what the scale has the advantage over QSMC with is by employing these subsampling, the, the subsampling technique, you can get very good computational efficiency with data size. Now, it would be remiss of us not to highlight a number of drawbacks of what we're doing. Um, so the practical implementation of these algorithms is not simple, it must be admitted, um, is computationally quite challenging to code. And the examples that we've got require some degree of bespoke derivations. Now, both of these could be improved in, in the future, um, but really this is a key bottleneck at the moment. As both Gareth and I highlighted, although we get this order one iterative complexity, really one of the drawbacks is doing this initialization and really understanding 
what happens with the initialization and potentially what would happen if you misinitialize these algorithms. So you, you would obviously not get the, the same degree of computational efficiency, although the scaling um, would be nice in some sense. And as Gareth highlighted right at the beginning of his slides on quasi-stationarity, the, the theory and the methodology underpinning these approaches just isn't as well developed. Uh, and it's, it's really only, uh, from my perspective at least now, that a lot of the key results that we'd be interested in are, are, are getting some attention. So where, where might this work go from this point? Well, I, I guess there are these direct extensions given by the immediate drawbacks. It's to think about further developing the theory, perhaps developing the methodology in some of the directions that, that Paul mentioned in his demo earlier, if you were there, and obviously wider and, and better practical application beyond what's in the paper. These notions are perhaps interesting, not just in the big data paradigm, um, maybe it's interesting in other settings, or perhaps they can be used in other big data paradigms. For instance, these multi-core or many-core approaches that I, I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And at the moment, we, we are sort of relying in the big data setting of doing an approximation, right? We, we try and find a very good modal point of the posterior distribution. So one thing we're very interested in at the moment is, is there a way to incorporate better the approximation into these types of algorithms themselves beyond just initializing the algorithm? How else can we uh, embed the approximation? And at that, I'm going to finish and hand back to Guy, I guess. If Guy's still there. Yes, I am. I am. You caught me right mid pouring drink. <laughs> um, right, well, thank you very much. Um, I would like to now call on Natesh Pillai from Harvard University to propose the vote of thanks. Can people hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Guy. And uh, so uh, I don't know how this is traditionally done. Is it uh, like people now have a beer? Is that is that what you like? It's, I know it's five o'clock in the UK, right? In my time there. <laughs> so, um, okay. So next slide, please. So first of all, uh, I really want to thank bo both uh, the authors for a really stimulating paper and also for um, RSS for um, organizing this. So... Here is my outline. Um, so I want, I'll just give a quick overview of the algorithm from my point of view. And then in this talk, I'm really going to take the user's point of view. Um, and I want to say, for, as a user, what would I want to know further about this? And then I'll talk a little bit about the complexity, again, as I see it. And then I'll compare it to the usual MCMC. Okay. So next slide, please. Um, okay, so the algorithm is quite novel. Um, it uses um, beautifully this idea of quasi-stationarity. And um, now I'll have to go really understand uh, um, because it's people, we actually in our curriculums do not study this in detail. It's really interesting. And the algorithm is a completely different alternative uh, uh, from the usual except project metropolis Hastings algorithm. So that's important to know. Um, and the, at, the, at the heart of it, this is what I'm going to call a basic algorithm because I want to differentiate the algorithm itself from the sequential Monte Carlo part because I think it's going to be useful later on in future work too. So at the basic, um, at the heart of it, the algorithm, just simulate a Brownian motion, of course, with some constraints, and then simulate a killing time, zeta. And if zeta is greater than t, you keep xt, right? And keep, you keep doing this again and again and again, um, and you have the distribution of xt is... Uh, according to pi. So, of course, to, to, um, to simulate zeta, all you really need to know is this function phi, which is the Laplacian um, of the function divided by two pi. And I do want to, you know, even to make it painfully clear, so this is, you know, this also, in the normalizing constant here goes away, right? This is one of the reasons why MCMC was popular in Bayes before people could do any computation. So, I want to stop here and say I want to call this the basic algorithm 
And then what the authors do is sort of a natural but quite ingenious use of sequential Monte Carlo to, to revive kill trajectory. So maybe let me show that using a picture. Next slide, please. So, so for again, so at, say, suppose you want your target distribution is normal distribution, the standard Gaussian. You can do is simulate the usual Brownian motion until time one, and then accept the Brownian paths. And so as we know, that you would get, um, you get, you will have the distribution of that to be uh, Gaussian. Next slide, please. But imagine that if your distribution is actually bimodal and not at Gaussian then I don't know if you can see the colors in my screen. There are some blue paths that will go towards the extremes and the middle is quite black. So if you could sort of kill the black paths and only keep the blue paths, then there is hope that you actually get the distribution in blue, right? So can we do that? Next next slide, please. So and in this simulation, I sort of did the hard, hard um, hazard function where I sort of killed naively the, the, the paths in the middle and only kept the rest and you get the distribution of interest. So if this point of view basically suggests that what, is hap what this algorithm is doing is basically important sampling the Brownian paths, right? So it's basically having an important sampler for the paths of the diffusion um, in quite a nice way. So if you think about that, then the sequential Monte Carlo is a natural tool to implement that. Right, so, and, and, and that's what the authors do. So I do, and so by the way, after this is quite, quite uh, an impressive paper. After reading this, it, you know, I have more questions than it answers uh, quite naturally. Like for instance, are there other implementations of this algorithm, the basic algorithm that's possible without using um, um, SMC methods? Although as you see, you cannot, basically the algorithm does important sampling of the path. So maybe um, you have to use SMC, I don't know. Okay, so that's my overview. Um, next slide, please. So now I want to talk um, talk about the user's point of view, right? So if you if you think about Random Walk Metropolis Hastings, it's you know in in a list published by Science, it was ranked to be number one in top twenty, um, uh, uh, top ten algorithms of twentieth century. The reason in my mind why it's number one is it because of its simplicity. Right, in the sense that for implementing it, all the user needs to know is pi y and pi, pi y and pi x, being able to um, evaluate the function up to a normalizing constant. So for the scale algorithm, I think Murray mentioned this a little bit. From a user's point of view, the user still have to compute this um, ux, the upper and lower bounds for the function phi. So I want to point out that this is a this is a fact of the basic algorithm, right? This has nothing to do with the sequential Monte Carlo part, because for the quasi stationarity to work, maybe that it seems like you need a lower bound for the the phi function, and it'll be nice to have some clarification of that. Regardless, the the user still has to compute these, and I wonder in in you know I do hope that this algorithm is be, going to be implemented and being studied and used um, just as like the random walk metropolis um, for in the future. So I really hope that we can have some ways of making this easier on the user to implement. Okay, next slide, please. So now, I, one of the things that is sort of unanswered in this paper, again, I want to take the big data aspect away for a minute and just consider this as a natural alternative for MCMC, and like Metropolis Hastings, is how long should T be, right? And it's not that well explained in the paper. So, so here is an example. So what happens if you choose um, pi to be just the uniform distribution on the real line. I know that's that's illegal, but let's say let's you know let's assume it's uniform distribution on the real line. That means pi is a constant, and what happens in that case is that phi of x is equal to zero, and you can work out that, and and therefore you actually never kill any path. It basically means that the algorithm accepts every single path of Brownian motion. Right, so it's already interesting in this in this simple calculation. It, it basically shows that it it sort of approximates the uniform distribution on the real line by a normal zero. It should be a capital T. That's a small typo there. So it it approximates the uniform distribution on the real line by a normal distribution with a very large variance. And I think in some sense this is the best case scenario because you're accepting um, all of the the paths, or at least you're not you're not doing. Um, there is not much killing happening. So, um, okay, next slide, please. I have a little bit more comment on this, how large T should be. Like for instance, right? So how large T should be, is should be an important factor that the user should know, 
Like for instance, um, here is a related fact. So for traditional MCMC algorithm, you know, if the posterior is not proper, we do know that the Markov chains are null recurrent and not positive recurrent, right? In the sense that um, the return times of the algorithms in the case of null recurrence have infinite expectations and consequently central limit theorems may not be valid, et cetera. By the way, I learned this fact maybe about 12 years ago from Gareth, so it's an homage to my time in Warwick. Um, so, so, so you can also understand what have you can also ask the same question here, right? Because you know, let's let's admit it. Sometimes we do have atrocities in which the posteriors we write down is not proper, and we we definitely want to have some um, builds in the algorithms to make sure that the algorithm um, gives you an indication. So this example that I showed you shows you a little bit of hint of what happens if the posterior isn't proper. Finally, again, from a user's point of view, I do want to say, what about diagnostics, right? In the sense that the usual Gelman-Rubin diagnostics will not work here, at least not naively, because the initial condition, the initialization plays a larger role for the performance of the algorithm or even the correctness. So at least the, the very first order of things, it would be wonderful to see if you can work out a, um, a, a simple Gelman-Rubin-like diagnostic test for the algorithm. Of the next next slide, please. I have three minutes. I'll... So I like the complexity ideas. Here's where I see it, um, on the complexity of the algorithm and, and also the error it makes. So for Laplace approximation, it takes all of the data, of course, but the relative error, that means that the estimator minus the truth, is roughly n to the power of negative three halves, I think. I think. And, and the naive subsampling algorithm, um, it takes all of the data multiplied by the amount of time it takes. Um, so there's a multiplicative effect of the time and the error as T goes is roughly one over square root of T. And for the scale algorithm, it's not multiplicative, but it's additive. And the initial n is there because they, all, they need all of the data to con construct the initial estimator. And of course, you can, you can have it smaller if you choose to have a, a worse estimator. But it's, I think it has the same relative error um, it should follow from the properties of the algorithm and Brownian motion, et cetera, but it's not, I'm not really sure if that's actually the case. I think it is the case. Finally, um, next slide, please. Um, I do want to compare it to the usual MCMC algorithm because it is an alternate MCMC algorithm, right? So how does this compare to a non-diffusive algorithm like HMC in the sense that here, even though this is a beautiful algorithm, the underlying proposal for scale is Brownian motion, okay, or other diffusions, which is inherently slow moving object, right? So, so how, you know, if you were to consider this as an alternative, like we do have to think about what is our best uh, state of the art is HMC. Uh, most people would agree, and I want to see how it compares. The other question I want to ask is that for this, this beautiful use of control variates, I think it's, it really hinges on the IIDness assumption. Is it possible to have a version of this for hierarchical models and have exactness? Okay, I think that's it. I'll conclude. Um, um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, I would say, first of all, thank, thanks very much to the authors for an, an amazing paper. Um, you know, I think it's a fundamental contribution to Monte Carlo methods. Usually the ideas in the history of this, this field usually flew, the ideas came from physics to statistics, right? Here, I think that the, the flow is reverse. I can genuinely say that, that the paper has so many beautiful ideas. I'll just mention a few. First, it takes the idea of quasi-stationarity and makes it implementable. Right, that alone requires a thunderous applause. And it uses the well-established technology of sequential Monte Carlo to get theoretical guarantees of the estimators. It really uses ingeniously the controlled variates to get exactness of, of the algorithm. And finally, it also ties in the performance of the algorithm to the posterior contraction rate. And in my mind, this has been a sort of a bridge in the field where there's this theoreticians who study the, the, the how well the model works and you know, uh, minimax and convergence rate, et cetera. And then there's people who study the complexity of the algorithms. This algorithm sort of beautifully um, bridges those two. And, um, and again, the, um, it goes on and on, but I'll just stop here and I enthusiastically propose the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Natesh. That's uh, really great. Thank you. I'd like to now call on Nicolas Chopin uh, to second the vote of thanks. I may I just me share my screen. Right. Um,
Does it work? Do you see my slides? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, great. Right, so thanks a lot for allowing me to discuss this very interesting paper. Uh, the first part of my discussion may sound a bit uh, critical, uh, but I will explain in the second part that uh, I'm being un a bit unfair on purpose. So to the authors, don't put uh, a long face. I can't see your face anyway, so it's not fun. Uh, just wait for the second part where I will be a bit more um, positive. Right. So I wrote this papers a few years ago with James Rich, where, where it's a review paper essentially we published in Statistical Science, where we wanted to compare many different approaches to, um, to approximate the, uh, the posterior distribution of uh, logistic regression. And uh, in this paper, what we found is that um, uh, the posterior distribution of such a model is very close to a Gaussian typically. Uh, if the dimension is below 50, honestly, you should go with uh, important sampling because it beats every other Monte Carlo methods under the sun. And uh, also you have uh, approximate method like EP that for su such models are almost exact, right? Uh, I forgot to say the reason why I wanted to write this paper is that I was a bit, uh, I, I could see that most people use logistic regression as an example for uh, uh, Bayesian computation. So I thought, uh, uh, with all these methods you can use, which one actually performs best? And uh, that was all findings, at least for simple models. So my first reaction when I looked at the paper was to look at uh, the numerical example in the paper. And uh, first example, we have a logistic regression, the dimension is two. Second example, logistic regression, dimension is four. Small progress. Third example, dimension is four. Uh, I think we are losing momentum here. And then dimension five. And to be fair, we have a fifth example, which is a mixture model. Okay. So by uh, the metrics of our paper, by our consideration, there's are quite simple uh, models. But again, I will explain that it's not entirely fair comment later. Also, point I, I like to have your uh, opinions of your turn on this, but it looks to me that there's something specific about the logistic regression model for the scale algorithm, because the scale algorithm relies on the function here. Do you see my pointer when I move it? Yes. Okay, so this function here, which is the second derivative of pi divided by pi, um, is very important in scale, and basically scale works well when you manage to bound this function or maybe you manage to bound it on a compact space and you do this uh, nested boxes as explained in the paper. And if you do a quick calculation for a Gaussian distribution, this function behaves like x squared when x goes to infinity. But if you have exponential taste, it's bounded actually, right? Just take uh, an exponential and if you differentiate twice and then divide again by the exponential, you get a constant. So I was surprised to see that this is an example, uh, an algorithm where exponential taste would be more favorable than Gaussian taste. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, if, uh, if you look at a specific logistic regression, you do have a posterior with exponential taste. So I I'm just wondering if this is the case where you, do you even need this uh, nested boxes construction and does the methods work well mostly for the reason that we have exactly the right taste. Right, so this is the second part where I say that I'm not being fair because the authors are not really interested in big D scenario, but in, instead a big M scenario. And uh, for example, in the second example, you can see that each data point is touched only eight times on average. And maybe in example three, it's touched only one time on average. That's quite, a, that's quite a fit, I think. Uh, most of the methods I know of don't have this property. They will need to access the data at least uh, thousands of times. Uh, also, I wanted to point to this review of Bardenay et al that also uh, present many different scenario, different algorithms to, uh, to deal with big N problems. And you can see the review, they, they explain quite well this is a difficult problem. There are no trivial solution. But if you want to do something exact, which puts quite a, very, quite a strong requirement, um, 
you can remark, as uh, Murray explained, that uh, it's easy to get an unbiased estimate of a log density because it's a sum. So if you just sample with replacement these terms, you get an unbiased estimate, right? So this is a basic remark. There are two problems, however. Uh, typically, this uh, has a big variance, so the control variant really helps to reduce the variance. Uh, in those settings, to obtain this control variant, you really need to obtain the mode and the the ACN of the mod of the posterior, so it, which also means you need a, a posterior which is a new model and Gaussian-like. And also, it's absolutely not trivial to construct an exact algorithm based on an unbiased estimate of a log density. And that's why scale is interesting, because you achieve this with scale, at least in the time limit, right? So that's, uh, that, uh, that looks innocuous, but it's a particularly difficult problem to go from an unbiased estimate of a log density to an exact algorithm for sampling from the posterior, which is an exponential of a log density. Right. Uh, we heard a lot of comments about the complexity in N, and uh, sometimes you can misunderstand the sum of the comments by the authors as uh, they manage to get an algorithm with a complexity which is smaller than two of N. Uh, of course, this is not really possible in practice. I mean, you need to look at all of the data at least once. And I'm pretty sure you need to do that several times, especially if you have outliers. I'm, I'm a bit worried that uh, any method that uh, tries to process the data too quickly will be less robust in a sense, because you need to look uh, maybe uh, over and over at those points that are outliers. So what makes more sense is to construct a TOFN algorithm with a small constant. And I think that's what the authors are trying to do here. Also, what is interesting, another approach would be to construct, to construct a parallel algorithm when you parallelize over the data or over the simulation. So the important sampling approach I mentioned at the beginning is trivial to parallelize and could be used as well for the example considered in the paper, I think. Also, to be honest, in industry and to talk to people in practice, what they do, they just subsample the data. That's not very clean, that's not exact, but they just they say, we have too, too much data, so we just take one on length of the data, and we do analysis. Uh, something I've not seen, but I would like to mention, is that you could also to perform some kind of sequential inference, where you process data uh, one data point after the next, and you stop when you consider you have seen enough data, because the confidence interval is small enough, for instance, for some quantity of interest. OK? So we have all these other approaches playing with the same kind of idea, which I've some of them quite basic, but deserve to be considered in practice, I think. A few words about the SMC algorithm. Um, please note that um, the approach suffers for double asymptotics because you have an asymptotic in N, the number of particles, and in T because you stop at some time T. If you do MCMC, you do have just simple asymptotics. Also, you could say that uh, T plays a bit the same role as a burn-in, and if you have to decide the longer the length of the chain and the length of the burn-in, you have two, two parameters to choose as well. But still, again, the MCMC converge in N, which makes me wonder if we could remove the bias by using some of these neat debiasing techniques, and Larry and Glenn. I'm pretty sure that the authors understand what I mean by that, and they may want to comment on this. Also, when you do an SMC algorithm, you have the ability to estimate the normalizing constant of the underlying uh, model. Uh, so I think in, your, in this context means you're, you have the ability to also estimate the probability that the Brownian machine survive until time t. I was wondering if this quantity is useful in some way, for instance, to assess the, the bias. So again, I'd like to have the opinion of the authors on this point. Uh, also, the authors comment on the fact that uh, in the SMC sampler, you could use better proposal distribution. Uh, I'd like to know more about this. Uh, my worry is that uh, if you want to do a good proposal, it might need to depend on the density itself you want to simulate. And then you lose the ability to just have access to a few terms of the log density. It might be tricky to get around this problem. Uh, you might lose the, the, the need uh, part of a scale that uh, you just have uh, need to access to a small subset of the data at any given time. Anyway, I think Guy wants me to conclude, so I will conclude quickly. Uh, I think 
it's it's fair to say that more efforts are required to make scale actually scale to generate challenging problems. I think it's a fair comment, and I think you others agree with that. Still, it's quite a, it's quite an achievement to manage to to obtain an algorithm that uh, is um, completely exact and uh, is quite fast and uh, based on quite elegant and uh, arguments. So I see it as promising, and I'm I'd be happy to see if. Uh, if people manage to make it work on, on other models. And for all these reasons, it's also, of course, my great pleasure to second the vote of thanks for these very nice papers that have strengthening the foundation of Fulfill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Well, um, I would like to thank the proposer and uh, seconder uh, for uh, their contributions. And it's now my um, delightful task to uh, formally propose the vote of thanks. Um, and normally when we're at the RSS, we do this by clapping. Now, of course, we can't see you or hear you. So our alternative on Teams is to please um, show your appreciation. Yes, I can see it already coming in on the chat. So please uh, either clap or put an emoji in or, or something like that. OK, I can see all that coming in now. Lots of claps. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so those will continue. And I, we can all watch those. Um, I'd like to move now on to the um, discussion part of the meeting. Um, I'd like to remind all discussants uh, in the open session, which now follows, that you have a maximum of five minutes speaking time. Uh, of course, um, whilst when we're online, we have considerable power to cut you off after five minutes. So uh, <laughs> beware. Um, and OK, so I have uh, six people who have already indicated their um, willingness to discuss the paper. And our first uh, discussant is Andy Wang from the University of uh, Bristol. So, Andy, I can see your slides are up. So if you'd like to go ahead, please do. Thank you very much. So firstly, thanks to the authors and all the presenters today for a really stimulating paper and stimulating talks as well. So I'm just going to briefly present two theoretical results, which I think will help facilitate the, f the further construction of quasi-stationary Monte Carlo methods. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So just to remind everyone, we're starting with, of course, a Markov process X. And in the familiar MCMC setting, we construct a chain where pi is the stationary distribution. And we all are very familiar with what that means. And the authors have highlighted in, in their presentation today what it means for pi to be quasi-stationary. And this is when the Markov process X is absorbed or killed at some stopping time tau D. And so in that case, pi is quasi-stationary if under these condition dynamics, initialized in pi, you remain in pi. And as uh, Gareth mentioned, this has a long history going back to the work of Yaglum. And these things appear naturally quasi-stationary distributions in the context of, say, population dynamics, where tau D is genuinely an extinction time, XT really is a population, and zero is the absorbing state once the population is extinct. And of course, historically, MCMC kind of inverted the study of Markov chains. Rather than starting with a Markov chain and deriving properties about its stationary distribution, we now start with pi as stationary distribution and construct the chain so that pi is the invariant measure. And in a similar vein, now quasi-stationary Monte Carlo inverts the study of quasi-stationarity. We want to uh, construct a killed process X with its kind of its own dynamics and the killing mechanism, which allows pi to be the quasi-stationary uh, distribution. And as they alluded to, this is considerably more delicate than simply constructing Markov chains, which possess pi as an invariant distribution. So if you go to the next slide, please. So we can extend their theorem one. So as Gareth mentioned in the paper, theorem one applies only to Brownian motions. Um, but it's possible, as he alluded to, to extend this to more general reversible diffusions, by which I mean uh, diffusions which possess a drift, which is a gradient form. And um, the, you can, we can write down the explicit killing rate as well. And furthermore, we can also remove their complicated tail condition, which appeared in the appendix. And so, of course, the idea here being it perhaps in various situations, you may be able to choose this grad A in such a way to guide the, the Brownian motion around the state space rather than relying on this pure random walk style behavior. So the second result uh, in the second box um, is partly addressing the issue that, that Natesh raised regarding kind of how big T has to be and if you like rates of convergence. Um, so 
this is not precisely stated here, I'll give a reference at the end, but loosely speaking, uh, the kill diffusion X, which could be this general reversible one, converges to quasi-stationarity at the same rate as the overdamped Langevin diffusion converging to stationarity, except with target pi squared. So if you consider the Langevin diffusion whose uh, invariant distribution is pi squared, this is a diffusion which will converge at some rate governed by the L2 spectral gap. Well, X uh, killed at kappa converges to quasi-stationarity at the same rate as that Langevin diffusion, in the sense that they have the same L2 spectral gap. And so this doesn't answer all questions, of course, but it gives some heuristic as to tell us, you know, loosely speaking, what is the rate of convergence, if you like, uh, of scale? And I get the feeling my time is probably running out, so I'll just move to my final slide. So next slide, please. Yeah. And so the, the things I presented today are stated and proven in the third uh, reference here. In my doctoral thesis, the, the middle reference, um, I've also got a preliminary version of that work and also a review more broadly of quasi-stationarity and MCMT in that connection. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at those. I guess I'll just conclude by saying once again, thank you to the authors um, and thanks to the RSS for organizing this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andy. Um, so our next discussant is uh, Hector McKim from the University of Warwick. Thanks. OK, great. We can see those slides. OK, okay so my uh, contribution to the discussion will be to compare a uh, scale algorithm with uh, another algorithm called Restore. Um, I'd just like to start off by thanking the authors for, for the paper, which I very much enjoyed uh, reading and was very interesting. Uh, and, and this contribution also is with Andy Wang from Bristol. And with that, I'll, if we can move on to the second slide, please. Uh, so I'll, I'll introduce the restore process before uh, making comparison to scale and quasi-stationary Monte Carlo. Uh, so the uh, restore process is uh, fundamentally a continuous time Markov process. It's given its name because it's randomly exploring and stochastically regenerating. It's built upon some underlying continuous time Markov process Y, which can be a diffusion or, or indeed a jump process. Furthermore, um, it's built upon a regeneration distribution mu and a state dependent regeneration rate kappa dash. Uh, so with these quantities, we can then define the restore process denoted X, which is defined by enriching the underlying process Y with the generations from mu at rate kappa dash, uh, which is to say that at the arrival time of the Prasson process with rate kappa dash, uh, the process regenerates from distribution mu, which means it effectively starts again and is simulated from mu. Now, the application to Monte Carlo comes because given uh, an underlying process Y and regeneration distribution mu, and there's a lot of flexibility in how to choose these two things, uh, you can define um, kappa dash uh, such that the process has invariant distribution pi. So to obtain samples uh, from pi, you just um, simulate the process X and take as output the entire uh, simulated trajectory. Uh, so I'll go on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so then to compare uh, scale and restore, well, the um, quasi-stationary Monte Carlo method detailed in the paper, which scale is built upon, uh, relies on a killing rate kappa, which we've seen, equal to uh, 5x minus some constant capital Phi. Uh, re restore is similar in its uh, reliance on simulating a Poisson process, uh, this time with rate kappa dash uh, equal to some partial uh, regeneration rate kappa tilde, function of x, uh, plus constant c times mu x over pi x. Now the event rate 2 can be seen as a generalization of the event rate 1. Indeed, when y is a Brownian motion, kappa tilde in 2 coincides exactly with phi in equation 1. Uh, 
Uh, and furthermore, when um, in the special in the special case where mu is equal to pi, the constant minus capital phi can be interpreted as the constant c. Um, so I'll just close my um, remarks with just commenting on the relative strengths of the two algorithms. Uh, for scale, as we've seen, it's it's its ability for subsampling, which makes it amenable to big data um, problems. For for restore, subsampling is as yet unavailable, but the strengths more uh, derives from its regenerative structure. Regenerations are fundamentally built into the simulation method, uh, which means unlike more traditional regeneration, regenerative simulation, uh, regenerations aren't obtained retrospectively, but are fundamental to the uh, simulation process. Uh, and uh, this can be helpful for tackling multimodal distributions. As when a regeneration occurs, occurs it's possible to uh, basically hop between modes. Um, but I think that's my time. So I'll just thank the authors again and um, pass back to the host. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. Um, I'd like now to uh, introduce our next discussant, who is David Steinsaltz from Oxford. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so how, how do I uh, how do I shift slides? Just say next slide. OK, right. Um, OK, well, so I want to thank the uh, thank the, the authors for this uh, really stimulating paper. Um, so what, as has been uh, suggested, one of the really, um, really exciting things about this paper is not just that it offers a, a novel algorithm, but that it offers really a new paradigm which suggests all kinds of new ways that we might be able to implement this general idea and take a lot of tools off the shelf that haven't really found application yet uh, for MCMC. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, the scale paper is telling us how to translate a statistical estimation problem into a kill diffusion with appropriate quasi-stationary distribution. And uh, it's quite natural to think of, of, as they did, of simulating from the quasi-stationary distribution by using a cloud of particles, killing the particles, and then using the remaining particles to, uh, to allow the particle to be reborn. And uh, so that works, and it has it's conceptually straightforward in uh, in a certain way. It it kind of very obviously implements that idea of uh, of you know con of sampling from the distribution conditioned on survival, and it can draw on a, a big uh, uh, a lot of available theory developed for sequential Monte Carlo. Challenges. Um, so, as has been mentioned, the implementation uh, can be somewhat tricky, um, and the the existing theory doesn't it really tell us very well how to deal with the um, the the number of particles simultaneously with the rate of convergence in time. Next slide. So, one of I think. Is numerous, and I think what will become very many, you know, alternative proposals is what we've been calling uh, regenerating scale or rescale. And this, in this case, we don't have a cloud of particles; we have a single particle that gets killed. And so, exactly as in the scale algorithm, but the rebirth distribution is now just the empirical measure of the particle's own past trajectory. This is an idea that was originally proposed by Aldous, Flannery, and Palacios for simulating quasi-stationary distributions on discrete state spaces. It has an advantage that the algorithm is fairly transparent uh, in, in a lot of ways. It has challenge, some challenges. Um, some theoretical complications arise from this not being a Markov process, right? You accumulate this whole 
history. And so new methods need to be developed or pulled out of uh, various corners for proving convergence and deriving the rate of convergence. And there's a problem of needing to store the past trajectory, which creates its own memory overhead, and particularly need to store the whole trajectory even during burn-in in some, in some sense. Um, next slide. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's basically what I had to say, just to say here, here are the references. So some theoretical development of this rescale idea to proving convergence uh, under appropriate, some appropriate conditions, in particular on compact state spaces, um, uh, was developed in this paper with, uh, with Andy Wang and Gareth Roberts. Um, and uh, Divakar Kumar has done some practical implementation of this idea in his PhD thesis. Okay, that's all. Okay, David, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now uh, invite Daniel Rudolph from University of Göttingen, please. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're a little bit quiet. Maybe say some more things. Maybe, uh, can you hear me now better than before? Yes. It's OK. It's a, it's a little bit quiet, but you're fine. I changed the settings a little bit more. OK. Um, I just speak a little bit louder then. Um, yeah, it's good now. It's good. First of all, of course, I also thank the, the authors of the paper for this interesting uh, contribution. And I'm also happy to be part of this event here. Uh, let me say um, I read the paper and then uh, I talked to Andy, who is, I think, an expert on this topic. So next slide, please. And he asked a question. I mean, the killing rate yeah, is, is one of the most important objects within the algorithm. Yeah? Choosing the killing rate in a, in a right way, you get this correctness result, theory one of the paper. And we started to think about, yeah, but what happens if you are not able to evaluate the killing rate? Yeah, you are only able to, to use a certain approximation. Yeah? And in discussing this a little bit, um, we started with a, let's say, illustrative scenario. Next page, please. Next slide. And that's as follows. So suppose you have a transition kernel Q on a state space N S0, so this can be a general state space, and we have the killing rate kappa. And now a transition from uh, dynamic yeah, from Xn to Xn plus 1 is as follows. So if you already killed, then you keep killed, you remain in this killed state, and otherwise what you do is you essentially flip a coin and this coin has death probability determined by the killing rate depending on the current state and then the process get ki gets killed. Otherwise, you just keep your transition going on with the kernel Q. And we assume here um, that we know to a certain extent the probability that Xn is not killed, yeah, that you remain in this set as zero. So we, we assume that there is this alpha between zero and one, and we have strictly positive functions such that we can control this probability that Xn is in, C, in S0. And this small x indicates uh, the initial state. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, here we are. Oh, sorry, back again. Yeah. And now we are only changing the killing rate. Yeah? This gives a different dynamic, of course, yeah? a different, in this setting, Markov chain. And this is indicated by the tilde above those random variables xn and xn plus 1. And the transition mechanism works exactly the same, just in this flipping coin uh, step, we kill this, this different process with this kappa tilde depending on the current state x and tilde. And we assume here the same regularity condition that there is an alpha tilde between 0 and 1 such that we 
have some knowledge about the probability that this x n tilde remains in S0. So those, those are to some extent uh, strong assumptions. Yeah? But what we would expect or what we wanted to show, what we wanted to get is somehow that those processes should be close to each other yeah, in the long time, in the long run, in the long time behavior, if kappa and kappa tilde are close to each other. Next slide, please. And as a preliminary result, uh, we were able to show that the total variation distance really from the conditional distribution of Xn, given that you keep alive, that you're still alive, compared to the other process, to the conditional distribution of the tilde process, where we have this tilde uh, killing rate, can be bounded by exactly the difference of the killing rates in L infinity measured times a constant depending on X times the minimum here involving or bringing in N and the difference of the alphas um, inverted. Yeah. So in this sense, um, this gives an indication that stability holds at least under the strong assumptions and I thank you very much. I thank you, the authors, very much for bringing this topic up. And I also thank Andy um, yeah, for discussing this with me. Thank you. OK, thank you, Daniel. Um, I'd like to now uh, bring in Ryan Chan from the Alan Turing Institute, who uh, has a joint contribution with Hong Sheng Dai from Essex. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Uh, so firstly, thank you to the authors for a great paper and a really interesting talk just now. Uh, this discussion, uh, like I said, is uh, joint with Hongsheng. So as been mentioned several times already, there is a growing need for algorithms and methods that can scale well with larger data sets or could be used in this big data context. So a particularly impressive contribution of the scale algorithm is that it can be applied in these contexts while still remaining exact. So in this discussion, we would just like to highlight some recent advances and methods that could be used in these contexts while still retaining exactness. A method called Monte Carlo Fusion, which actually has some connections with scale. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Monte Carlo uh, Fusion is a divine and conquer method. And these methods have been proposed in order to adapt MCMC to reduce the computational cost of the algorithm, particularly in cases of tall data sets. And this was um, actually brought up by Murray early in the talk, but I'll quickly recap. Um, and so in this kind of approach, the data is split up into disjoint subsets and then standard MCMC methods or any other Monte Carlo method are used on each subset. And then the distributed analyses are then recombined into a single coherent inference. And so in these approaches, the target is of this particular form given by equation one, uh, where we have a product of each of these sub posteriors which are densities representing each of the distributed inferences that we want to unify. And so clearly an advantage of these methods is that um, the, the inferences on each of these smaller data sets can be conducted in parallel. And so one could exploit a large cluster of computing cores if they have that available to them. In contrast, uh, as mentioned by uh, Murray, the scale algorithm detailed in this paper are more traditional MCMC methods or single core algorithms. And so it'd be interesting to see um, if there are any parallel implementations of scale in the future to fully utilize this um, increase in computing power that we have today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's just a, a visual representation of the approach um, I just described. So inference is performed on each of these sub posteriors, and those are then recombined to get samples for the posterior of the full data set. Uh, next slide, please. So several divide and conquer methods were actually mentioned in the scale paper. For instance, the, the Vistras sampler or the consensus Monte Carlo method. Uh, however, as noted in the paper, um, a primary weaknesses uh, of this method is that the recombination of the sub posteriors is inexact and involves some approximation to the sub posteriors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, however, um, the fusion algorithm is exact and is the first exact fusion inference method that allows sampling from equation one. And so this is achieved by constructing a rejection sampler on the extended space. Uh, and so unlike these previous methods um, that were mentioned, uh, fusion actually avoids any approximation to the subposteriors. And so in this sense, fusion is, is similar to scale and does not introduce any approximation 
uh, error besides the, the usual Monte Carlo error. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Uh, so lastly, I'd just like to highlight some connections that Fusion has with scale. Um, so for instance, both algorithms use the large band diffusion in their mathematical construction, although it's not explicitly used in scale. Um, both algorithms utilize this methodology for the exact simulation of diffusions. In particular, they use um, methodology referred to as uh, path-based rejection sampling or the exact algorithm, which Murray spoke about in his demo talk. Uh, and lastly, uh, the Monte Carlo fusion uses this function phi, uh, which was um, defined in equation three of this paper. Um, but however, the, the use of subsampling ideas were not explored in fusion, but the, uh, the unbiased estimators that were developed for phi is a contribution of this paper, which, which could be employed and could potentially improve the, the performance of the fusion algorithm. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Uh, so yeah, just to conclude, here are some references, uh, and yeah, thanks again to the authors uh, and to the organisers as well. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, I'd now like to invite Sebastiano Grazzi from TU Delft, uh, along with co-authors, not speaking, Juris Birkins and Kengo Kamatani. So Sebastiano. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the authors of the paper and uh, also for the organizer and the speakers of this discussion meeting. So in this uh, contribution, uh, we would like to propose uh, a, a class of mean reverting processes for the quasi stationary Monte Carlo methods. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so here we list uh, some Monte Carlo methods. Uh, all of them target a uh, general uh, measure pi, which is uh, proportional to the exponential of minus some potential function u and relative to a um, reference measure mu zero. On the left column, <clears throat> we find uh, um, algorithms which uh, uh, consider mu zero to be the Lebesgue, the Lebesgue measure, while on the right column, uh, we find um, uh, methods which take mu zero to be a Gaussian measure. So in the in the bottom left, you find the scale algorithm. Uh, on the top, we start with the uh, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, uh, such as the random walk metropolis method algorithms and the preconditioned crank uh, Nicholson schemes. In the central row, uh, we find that the class of uh, piecewise deterministic Monte Carlo methods. This class of algorithms are quite uh, interesting because they also share the property of having the exact subsampling. So they, they have the same uh, uh, similar uh, property, scaling property of the scale algorithm. So the most prominent uh, algorithms are the bouncy particle sampler and the zigzag sampler. Um, Recently, we highlighted uh, this uh, new algorithm called the Boomerang Sampler, which uh, is going to, to be uh, pu published in a paper at the International Conference of Machine Learning 2020, and is a joint work with uh, Yari Spirk and uh, Kengo Kamatani and uh, Garrett Roberts. So the, the nice properties we found with the Boomerang Samplers and the nice performances over the Bouncy Particle Sampler and the Zigzag Samplers um, motivated us to, to wonder if there is a, um, a place for uh, a quasi um, stationary Monte Carlo method to, to be placed on the bottom right of this table. So, which, uh, which is the device to have a target to, 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 be, to have an invariance measure which is uh, written relative to a Gaussian reference measure. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So why a Gaussian reference measure? Uh, well, in uh, high dimensions, uh, in infinite dimensions, there is no such as a uh, uh, Lebesgue measure. So, and the Gaussian measures are very natural in uh, infinite or high dimensions. Indeed, we have uh, several applications such as uh, the Gaussian process uh, regression, spatial statistics, Bayesian inverse problems, and there are also many other applications. Uh, we can also, in the Bayesian setting, uh, uh, consider um, uh, consider Gaussian reference measure when we take uh, Gaussian priors, or even uh, just a standard uh, uh, density written with respect to the Lebesgue measure can be uh, uh, expressed uh, as a perturbation of its Gaussian approximation. So here we illustrate the boomerang sampler. 
the boomerang sampler is a piecewise deterministic Monte Carlo method. So it's uh, characterized by continuous trajectories and uh, random events, which here are in pink, with pink dots. And the performances of these samplers are uh, really related with the number of Poisson events uh, thrown. In particular, uh, the fewer uh, random events, uh, the better the performances. So the peculiarity of the boomerang sampler is having these curved trajectories, so ellipti ellip elliptical trajectories, which are uh, invariant to Gaussian measures. And uh, in our analysis, we, um, we see and we, we show that uh, this leads often to a reduced number of uh, random events, so to a better performances compared to the bouncy particle sampler or the zigzag sampler. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so with the, with the scalar or with the um, quasi-stationary uh, Monte Carlo methods, we would like to propose a, a, a similar thing, namely uh, to, to consider as a class of reference processes the orstein ullenbeck processes, which are mean reverting and have uh, an invariant Gaussian measure. And then compute the killing times uh, of the orstein ullenbeck processes to have the correct quasi-stationary distribution. So in these regards, uh, we would like to, to ask uh, if this approach is practicable. practicable. I mean, uh, these, uh, these uh, orsen ullenbeck processes are linear processes, so many computational techniques for the Brownian motions should be still valid for these linear processes. Um, furthermore, if uh, um, the, this uh, computational method could lead to a, a more efficient method, namely, uh, well, we, the process won't uh, wander off to infinity, but will stay, will stay uh, attracted around one point by the mean reverting factor, and this could lead uh, uh, to a, le a reduced killing rate, so to a better performances. Finally, uh, we would like to ask uh, if you do, if you expect uh, um, some limitation or difficulties to generalize uh, the scale algorithm with the proposed setting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so some wonderful discussion contributions there. Um, that's the end of the contributions uh, from people who've um, already um, told us um, that they want to provide one online now. Um, we have been keeping an eye on the chat, um, and I haven't noticed anything, anybody who wishes to discuss. If anybody wishes to discuss in addition, could they please just use the chat now to indicate that? Or if one of the RSS staff has noticed something that I haven't. Okay. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to call on the authors of the main paper to reply if you so wish, um, you have up to 10 minutes, um, but I'm also going to remind you that you have the opportunity, of course, to give a more considered reply uh, written in the journal. OK, can people hear me? Um, I'm going to yes. um, at least begin, and I think it will be a, a, a brief um, a comment. Um, I think in the main, we'd like to just thank the discussants very, very much for very stimulating comments. Lots of great thoughts and ideas going forward, and we look forward to actually looking at them in more detail and making and making sort of detailed replies to the various questions that have come up. Um, just a couple of things briefly. I mean, so I think in reply to the proposer and seconder, uh, Nicola, yes, I think we are very much aligned on our our thoughts about where we are with uh, quasi-stationary Monte Carlo and the scale algorithm. There's a long way to go, I think, or certainly uh, a, a reasonable amount to, of way to go to, to, to get some kind of general solution that could be used for big data uh, from this kind of methodology. But um, and we hope that we've made a, a start which is stimulating and, and others might jo join us in the kind of quest to sort of improve the practical um, uh, uh, the practic practicability of the algorithm. Um, one of the specific things that you raised about, um, yes, if you have exponential tails, the phi function becomes bounded. That's a very nice case. Um, um, one of the interesting things that we've discovered, um, and we don't really have any theory about this, but um, 
Or in the opposite case, when you have extremely light tails, um, then the phi function starts to behave really um, quite badly in the tails. It starts to grow perhaps quicker than a quadratic. And one, uh, but one thing about that, that's some, somewhat mitigated by the fact that when you've got a light tail distribution, you don't go out to those light tails as, as often. And in constructing your sort of layers for your Brownian motion, um, it turns out that you can sort of construct them in a way which means that you, you don't need to go to those very high values as often. Um, so there's a sort of natural tempering of kind of effect. Um, um, but yes, we haven't really tried many examples for uh, heavy uh, for heavy tail distributions and for distributions that have exponential tails. Of course, in those cases, uh, it's definitely the case that um, um, Brownian motion is uh, probably the wrong proposal distribution to be using, and that very much links to um, some comments that Natesh uh, made, which we very much agree with. Um, uh, there's lots of kind of interesting alternatives to Brownian motion that we'd like to sort of look at. Um, Andy Wang in his, his extremely nice uh, PhD thesis on, on this area um, actually looks at some of these questions and, and there is a context in which when you're choosing Brownian motion, uh, when you're choosing a, a diffusion as your as your proposal process, uh, there is a there is a context in which Brownian motion has an optimality property. But of course, there are lots of other things in which we might, uh, uh, situations in which we might want to choose a, a, a non-diffusion process. There's lots of things we still have to be, have to be, um, uh, we have to look at in terms of this. Um, and the other, th yes, um, great idea, Nicola, uh, uh, to use the Rian Glynn uh, uh, approach. Um, and, you know, that might be an interesting thing to explore. Um, and um, yeah, I think I probably missed, I can't even read my own writing here, but thank you very much to all the discussions. Um, uh, we've really enjoyed the day and uh, thanks for your comments and interest in our work. And thank you in fact also to the uh, everyone who's turned up for this talk. Um, I, I know we've had a, a good audience and, and uh, we really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much. Gareth, were you speaking on behalf of the, the four authors? Uh, yeah, let me just check. We, um, does is anybody um, uh, urgently want to say something and correct something that I've said or? No, OK. So, silence is good. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Gareth, on behalf of the authors. Um, I'd like to thank everyone very much for uh, attending the meeting, taking the time to do that. Um, also to the speakers uh, for a great paper. Um, and clearly it's great just because of the large audience that's turned out and all the discussion that we've had. All the discussants and the proposer and seconder for working so hard on the paper and presenting us a, you know, a great uh, set of uh, contributions. So thank you. And please read it all when it comes out in the paper, um, which hopefully won't be too long. Um, I'd like to also thank the RSS staff um, just because um, they make sure that this happens and keep an eye on many things and, uh, you know, before and during and after the meeting. So thank you very much for working so hard, as always. Appreciate it. Uh, my final job is to advertise um, the next discussion meeting, which is called The Language of Betting as a Strategy for Statistical and Scientific Communication. This will be by Glenn, uh, Glenn Schaefer and it will be presented at the RSS conference online in September 2020. And if you're interested in further news about upcoming discussion meetings, uh, these are all on the RSS website, announced in Stats Life and members newsletters. If you want to be personally informed about all future discussion meetings, please email journal at rss.org.uk to be added to the distribution list. OK, so that's the end of the uh, the meeting. Um, it was very nice to um, see you all. Um, if, if some of you was just without video and sound um, and see you next time. <laughs>